so good afternoon and welcome to everybody uh, on behalf of Francesco Pignatelli, uh, Elise Action Leader and Senior Program Manager, uh, on behalf of Lorena Hernandez, Project Officer, and on behalf of myself, uh, Simon Richard, uh, External Consultant. Um, uh, all of us uh, working for a Joint Research Center of European Commission. So today we will be hosting this webinar uh, with the title uh, Geodata Marketplaces Supporting Location Intelligence. So maybe uh, first a few words about Elise for those who don't know uh, about it. So Elise is an, uh, is, a, is an action in part of the ISA Square program. The acronym stands for European Location Interoperability Solution for e-government. And uh, it's aiming to providing cross-border and cross-sector interoperability solutions uh, for public administrations, business and citizens. So there are many 54 different actions running in this size square program that are tackling interoperability from different angles. While Elisa is the only one actually of, the, uh, of them that uh, um, is uh, tackling the location uh, dimension. Uh, within the context of uh, ELISA knowledge transfer activities, uh, we are organizing uh, periodically webinars like uh, th those one today, uh, which is seen on the next slide. Uh, uh, and whose aim is actually to engage in an agile, agile way uh, with the topics of relevance to the digital transformation and also to uh, share the results of uh, ELISA action activities. Uh, as it's seen on the next slide, so our speakers today, we have uh, George O'Neill and Leia Itrus work from Deloitte, uh, who will guide us uh, through the topic of geodata marketplaces, supporting location intelligence. Uh, to make uh, the webinar even more exciting, there are also three guest speakers presenting their practical experiences. Javier Perez Trufero uh, from Carto, uh, Jill Saligues-Simmel from ESRI and Valdis Karulis from Geodata uh, uh, Hub. So thank you also for, to the guest speakers uh, for joining today. And they all will uh, try to provide us the insights on definitions, uh, background and context for Geodata marketplaces, uh, providing us a brief uh, timeline of developments, explaining how we arrived to today's solutions and uh, showcasing the examples of geodata marketplaces by ESRI Geodata Club and CARTO. I believe they all would give us a, a really solid base for fruitful discussion, uh, which is also uh, foreseen uh, for the end of uh, this uh, webinar. So before giving a virtual floor to the first speaker, uh, I would ask you uh, to take a part in a, in a short poll uh, answering uh, actually two questions. Um, I, I suppose you can see the poll already on your screens. So first question is about uh, your affiliation. So where are you coming from? Is it uh, public administration and European level, national public administration, regional? Uh, are you from private sector, uh, consultant, NGO and so on? Uh, the second question is about uh, how are you familiar with the concepts of the geodata marketplace or data marketplaces in general? So here is also some useful input for our speakers later on. So whether are you familiar or not familiar with either of concepts? Uh, are you familiar with the concept of data marketplaces only? Are you familiar with both concepts or you know both concepts very well? So let's uh, give us another 20 seconds for your answers. So, okay, at this moment, I will, I think we should end the polling and uh, share the results. So uh, regarding the first question, so it's obvious that the vast majority of you is coming from national public administration uh, or regional uh, public administration. There are also many from private sectors, SME. Um, Regarding the question about the familiarity of the concepts of geodata marketplaces or data marketplaces, it's obvious that you are quite familiar with both of the concepts. Okay, there are also some of you that are not familiar with this concept, but I hope that uh, our speakers today will uh, uh, clarify 
uh, all the dots. So at this point, I would uh, uh, give the floor, the floor to the George O'Neill from Deloitte to start with the first uh, part of the presentation. Please, George. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, so yes, uh, the topic of this webinar, um, because of the kind of ever-growing use of different forms of geos geospatial data to support location intelligence, different types of public and private services on top of that, we wanted to look in this webinar at how geodata marketplaces and ecosystems uh, can support this. And so in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to first just start with some key definitions, which you've, some of you have already indicated that you're uh, familiar with, um, and a bit of context so that we can then go on to, uh, to some nice practical examples, which we have from our guest, <coughs> our guest speakers later in the presentation. So just to start with the, uh, the concept of a data marketplace. So here, as, as you can see from the definition of your, uh, on your screen, uh, we're looking at platforms where users are buying or selling different types of data sets and data streams from, from many different sources. <coughs> and normally we're looking at cloud services where, the, where this data is being uploaded to the cloud. And the platforms are enabling a, a self-service data access, um, ensuring security, consistency, and high quality of data. And in our context, we might want to emphasize here that we could, uh, we, we said in that definition, buying or selling, but we could look at multiple different ways in which this data is exchanged under different terms and conditions, which may be more relevant to the, the public sector as well. Um, on the next slide, uh, we have the closely linked concepts of the, uh, the data ecosystem. Uh, which uh, we see as being a, a key, uh, a key uh, concept ever growing in importance. Uh, and this really refers to the different stakeholders uh, that surround this uh, marketplace or other, other platform and the different actors that interact on this, this type of platform or in the particular in environment in order to exchange data and thereby uh, uh, create, um, create value. Um, Onto the next slide, please. So, looking now at uh, the geodata uh, marketplaces, uh, well, this this concept and, and practice clearly being the, the subset of data marketplaces, which refer uh, or, or focus particularly on uh, geospatial data and information. Uh, the development of these types of geodata uh, marketplaces has been a consequence of um, development over the, the past few de decades. And we're seeing now the kind of new business models and, and public platforms appearing and building richer ecosystems and further facilitating uh, widespread ac accessibility of uh, geospatial data. Uh, and with these geodata marketplaces, again, we have different data providers, different data users able to meet in the one uh, virtual space and able to exchange information and crucially or importantly also obtain um, new insights. And in terms of how these contemporary platforms, um, they're still, still on the previous slide, sorry. Um, in terms of how these uh, contemporary platforms uh, differ from previous um, iterations, because this has been a, a development, uh, we might emphasize on one, this, this real, the central role of data. So as well as before, perhaps uh, an ecosystem or a marketplace might be more focused around a particular application or software, we now see data being the real crucial thing that's, that's drawing uh, the marketplace together and is the key commodity that is uh, traded um, and around which maybe other services are developed. Um, and also increased uh, ecosystems uh, thinking, the, the concept of the data ecosystem that I mentioned before. So where we're moving beyond a unilateral relationship of provision of data from one uh, provider to, one, uh, to, a, to a user, to focus on providing that space where data providers and data users can exchange um, uh, of, of multiple different types of, and subcategories, vendors, re-vendors, intermediaries, and other categories you could think of. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as, as said, this, um, uh, I mean, there are, there are changes from, from what we've seen before, but at the same time, this is a continuation of stre trends that stretch back to the 90s with the, the first generation of virtual marketplaces and uh, the spatial data infrastructures that, that existed to provide these geospatial um, data and, and continues through the, the 2000s into the, the contemporary day where we see this, this more ecosystem focus. And uh, as the, the overall results of, of this are kind of a new paradigm where we have an unprecedented level of data availability and accessibility thanks to these um, 
and, and linked to these new markets, and whereby we see this formerly expensive asset of geospatial data becoming more affordable. Uh, we see greater accessibility both in terms of uh, the usability of these platforms and, um, and in, terms in the economic sense. And we see just a, um, as well as accessibility um, for different types of users in terms of the uh, uh, end users or um, developers who may want APIs instead. Um, and, uh, and a greater heterogeneity of data sources and a variety of different pricing models. So that's the kind of uh, the background a little bit on these uh, geodata marketplaces. Uh, I will hand over now quickly to Leo, who's going to describe a little bit about how this applies to uh, to location intelligence. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, George. So now that we have really explored this uh, kind of key context and, and developments related to the concept of geodata marketplaces, it's time to look into uh, what are the, the opportunities that this, uh, these developments really represent. So um, in this contemporary phase that, that George just uh, outlined, um, there's uh, certainly uh, some, some opportunities, uh, some benefits to, to where we uh, are today and to the use of geodata marketplaces that apply to both uh, the public and private sphere. Um, we can start with the public sector and uh, some of the key opportunities there is certainly, first of all, uh, this opportunity to enable collaboration with other org organizations and, and uh, in, in that way, public-private partnerships as well. So uh, geodata marketplaces, of course, it means by definition that um, collaboration is really enhanced through this sort of virtual marketplace. So it's a, a type of interactive self-service form of sharing data, which opens an opportunity for more actors really to participate in an ecosystem, uh, seeing that there's no longer this uh, unidirectional business relationship uh, that George was also explaining. Uh, we'll see some examples of this by, by our guest speakers later on. Uh, second of all, there's also this element of, of uh, focus on efficiency and delivering cost savings through uh, governmental geospatial one-stop shops, we could call it. So um, indeed, virtual marketplaces have int intrinsically already changed uh, the way that we exchange goods and services, taking it all the way back to the, to the 1990s and eBay and, and such types of platforms. And a geospatial one-stop shop um, should not be mistaken in that sense for applying to only the private sector, as there are indeed many examples of, of public sector actors providing or working to provide platforms platforms where data can be um, exchanged. Um, thirdly, there's also the element of improving um, service quality and effectiveness through better access to information. So in essence, this just means that by simplifying the, the findability and accessibility of data, all stakeholders involved will achieve better access to information. And then on the more uh, private sector side of it, um, and many of these points, by the way, do also <laughs> apply to the public sphere and, and vice versa. But first of all, um, there's this element of building ecosystems around these platforms, allowing for better access to data. Um, now, accessibility, of course, is a challenge for any actor, global um, actors or, or smaller, but we can, for example, imagine that for SMEs, uh, this type of ecosystems uh, thinking is something that can be capitalized on. Um, you can involve more actors, it becomes uh, easier to overcome uh, traditional obstacles of obtaining data. Um, and I also think the following sections of the presentation will give some good examples of this. Secondly, naturally, we have the increased efficiency and cost savings again. Um, and this brought by this opportunity to, to create new and innovative products, tools, and even uh, business models. And then lastly, and this also applies to the public sphere, is the opportunity to engage the public through uh, volunteered information. So again, enhancing like a sustainable ecosystem means that you can gain access to new sources of data. So it could be, for example, third party uh, volunteered um, information. 
so just to to add on to this where which direction um, are we going in and so here it's it's relevant to to bring in um, a definition of location intelligence so so what is location intelligence in the elisa glossary and based on gartner research um, we define it as uh, the process of deriving meaningful insights from geospatial data relationships people, places, or things to solve particular challenges such as demographic or environmental analysis, asset tracking, and traffic planning. So for this webinar, we're interpreting an, uh, location intelligence as a broader con uh, concept. So it encompasses uh, processes naturally, and we're uh, seeing developments in, in processes in the field. We have new technologies. Um, evolving around GIS, but also um, artificial intelligence uh, and, and other, other uh, developments. And this allows us to turn our inputs. And these inputs can be from a vast variety of information sources. So traditional geospatial sources and more innovative sources or, or newer sources, we could say, into outputs that will then necessarily be more uh, location intelligent, if we could put it in that way. Um, so, using, uh, using um, a broad definition of location uh, intelligence as discussed in, in the previous slide, it's also important to look beyond uh, a business intelligence aspect and consider not only the technology, but also, um, also the inputs and outputs allowing to transform geospatial data into knowledge. So therefore we define location intelligence as being more than analysis of geospatial information or geographic information systems alone. It's really also the capability to visualize this, visualize spatial data to identify and analyze uh, new relationships. So um, a 2013 publication from Deloitte uh, discusses the power of location intelligence or zooming in and it defines three key steps which should apply uh, to all uh, data intelligence uh, initiatives. So first of all, you have this idea of collecting, right? So collecting the location-based data that's already available and integrate this data um, into decision-making. And then second of all, we have connecting, which is of course very closely linked to data ecosystems again. So it's important to connect with, with partners and, and data sources that could support uh, whatever mission priorities you may have. And then lastly, uh, and importantly, of course, there's the element of protect. So by understanding privacy and, and data protection issues related to location-based data, you can also then focus on delivering value in exchange for sharing location information. So now that we've brought uh, many different concepts to the table, um, it's time to kind of ask the question of, okay, so ecosystems and location intelligence, how do they uh, support one another and how does it relate to geodata marketplaces? Um, so indeed, first of all, um, ecosystems centered around really this concept of sharing, exchanging, using, and reusing data are key to provide an environment for the creation, managing, and sustaining of initiatives. As we've seen, uh, location intelligence is uh, really derived from these new processes that allow a vast uh, a vast array of inputs to be turned into location intelligent outputs. Uh, we also see that by collecting, uh, connecting and protecting data through sustainable ecosystems so we can derive new and deeper geospatial insight. Uh, what we see then is as a, as a result, both private and public actors are really picking up on this. Um, there's new and innovative tools, platforms, business models that are growing as a result. So really by all bringing together all these concepts, the key kind of punchline here is that geodata marketplaces really encapsulate this ecosystems thinking and it serves as an enabler for, for increased uh, location intelligence. Uh, so on that note, I think it's time to, to 
uh, give the floor to Jill, who is our first uh, guest speaker to give us some, some concrete examples of what it is we're talking about today. So, so please, Jill. Uh, good afternoon and thank you, Leah. So I, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Esri's ArcGIS Living Atlas to the world as an example of, of one of these new types of geodata marketplaces. The Living Atlas is a curated collection of over 8,000 authoritative maps and data, imagery, and tools that are contributed from our users worldwide, as well as content that's published by Esri and our partners. It includes feature layers and 3D scenes, imagery, live sensor data, and more. The content is typically worldwide or by major region, and uh, much of the content that's found in the Living Atlas is publicly available without restrictions. While a subset is either subscriber content um, with layers such as Landsat imagery, landscape analysis layers, and historical maps, or we also have premium content which includes layers such as demographic and lifestyle layers. Okay. The Living Atlas is really enabled by geospatial infrastructure. And this is the, the important point that I wanna make. Um, it's the big idea and it's what makes the Living Atlas and other marketplaces like this possible. Geospatial infrastructure encompasses the distributed cloud storage and computational infrastructure the web software and applications and microservices. Uh, it, it brings together the people and the content providers, creators, the platform providers, as well as those stakeholders and consumers all together. Uh, and really in a way it governs the layer and feature le level access and security of this very expansive content. So geospatial infrastructure is how users can authenticate and share their data in open and secure data spaces, kind of like a social network for data. Uh, our, our Esri Living Atlas of the World uh, is a manifestation of this new type of mar marketplace. Okay. So the Living Atlas is deeply integrated and integral to ArcGIS software and its content sits right alongside users' own content, as well as access to tens and thousands of publicly shared items that are uncurated, uh, that are uh, available through ArcGIS users worldwide. It's also used in field apps and business apps and many more ways. And it's this deep integration that enables an ease of use for the community to participate in the Living Atlas. Um, for example, with the Community Maps program. It's the deep integration that makes it easy for the community to share feedback and get information from others. So I'm going to start by just showing you, um, we have the Community Maps program and ArcGIS based maps. Um, this is where the Community Map program work with authoritative data contributions with continuously improving the ArcGIS base maps. There's three paths for our users to have contributions into the ArcGIS base maps and through the community maps program. They can provide feedback um, through a, um, a, a exchange of information and, and drawing on the uh, Esri base maps to provide that feedback. They can create detailed features. Um, this is quite popular with organizations that want to provide like campus level feature information. And authoritative data providers can share data layers and services by nominating items to the Living Atlas. The contributors um, work with curators at Esri before the maps are shared with the Living Atlas. And contrib the contributed data are added to Esri base maps, uh, which are fully customizable with our vector base map editor. So let's take a quick look at, at how geospatial infrastructure enables uh, a new type of systems thinking approach to continuous data improvements. One of the things I'm personally excited about um, with this, because I've always been a, an active OpenStreetMap editor, is uh, our new OpenStreetMaps um, 
contributions and programs. So you're probably all aware that OpenStreetMap is a free editable map of the world built by a community of mappers that contribute and maintain data about roads, trails, bridges, and, and more. The Living Atlas provides access to OpenStreetMap data in many ways, uh, including the ESRI hosted OpenStreetMap vector base maps and live feature layers, which enable you to display, query, and even analyze the data. The Living Atlas now provides new ways for authoritative data providers to share their authoritative data with the OpenStreetMap community mappers uh, to improve the OSM data and continuously update it to reflect authoritative data um, into OpenStreetMap and then um, make that return journey back into the Living Atlas. Earlier this year, in partnership with Facebook, OpenStreetMap Daylight was released. Um, OpenStreetMap Daylight enhances the OpenStreetMap with additional data validation and detection using AI and machine learning to remove map vandalism and geometry errors in the OpenStreetMap data. Uh, the OpenStreetMap Daylight map is now in beta release and hosted by Esri, uh, providing the latest version of the OpenStreetMap Daylight distribution. So it's in this way that authoritative data from the source data providers contribute to this virtuous cir circle of continuous improvements of community maintained OSM data, making that round trip from authoritative provider uh, into um, Esri base maps, into OpenStreetMaps, um, and back um, providing that data back as vector data layers that's available to the authoritative providers um, and users in ArcGIS. Another very popular set of content that's provided through the Living Atlas is live data layers. Um, these live feeds are useful in data sets related to weather, hazards, air quality, um, and other types of events like fires. Um, these live feed data layers are provided by source providers such as NOAA, USGS, NASA, and others. And finally, with this quick tour, I'd just like to conclude with an, another example of ecosystem thinking. The geospatial infrastructure is enabling a new type. Um, yeah, we can go on. Um, thank you. Uh, a new type uh, of ability to bring together data and from disparate sources and contributors around the world. And these data can be brought together now in new ways to create new insights for location intelligence. Um, we've demonstrated this through the Living Atlas, Living the Indicators of the Planet, where we have continuously updated data from these multiple sources worldwide being brought together to show key metrics on topics that affect us all, such as air quality, drought worldwide, sea ice change, uh, and, and more. Uh, this wouldn't be possible without being able to bring together the data um, that's dynamically updated based on services in this new type uh, of geospatial infrastructure. So we can see that one of the most significant roles of marketplaces, such as the Living Atlas, is really in delivering immediate value to users through entire data spaces uh, and, and across the users in the world. Uh, and with that, I'd like to, to turn it back to you, Leo. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Jill, for that uh, interesting uh, presentation of, of the Living Atlas. I think on that note, we can uh, hand it over to, um, or actually move to the next section, apologies. So we're now uh, going to be looking at uh, some more geodata marketplaces demonstrated. So here we have uh, Geodata Hub uh, and Carto uh, present. 
Uh, so we will start with uh, with the presentation by Valdis from from Geo Data Hub. So please, uh, Valdis, the floor is yours. Um, yeah. Uh, greetings for everyone. Thanks, Gio. Thanks, Leah. Uh, my name is Valdis Carlos, uh, and uh, I'm a GIS project manager in uh, one of the lead cartography and geospatial sector company in the uh, Baltic region. Karsh is the native Yansat. Today, I will uh, present you about one of the geospatial data dissemination tools for uh, Baltic region, Geodate Hub platform. Geodate Hub uh, was created in uh, cooperation to uh, uh, two Baltic uh, GIS companies, one company which uh, I represent, Karshis Donetsi Bianyaset, and our project partner company, Re2 from Estonia. The project was founded by European country, European uh, Union uh, cross-border cooperation program. Uh, my uh, today's story is not uh, that more about uh, adding geograph geographical context uh, to business data, but more about adding value for businesses, businesses based to geographical data. The main goal of uh, uh, Geodata Hub is to provide in the Baltic uh, operating businesses, uh, business companies, and uh, government government sector uh, institutions with the up-to-date geospatial data services uh, in simple accessible way uh, it means through the self-service portal um, please next slide um, how it work uh, we collecting together all valuable geospatial data about the baltic territory and transform it from initial raw data format into a convenient and modern way for software implementators in the results we transform this data to uh, REST IPA service formats. Mm, the best and the most up to date uh, geospatial IPAs about Baltic region, which helps the client to make better decisions for its own business and uh, improves their, their products, mostly based to receive detailed location uh, intelligent insights. Mm, the portal provides uh, provide support for the fundamental geospatial uh, related business needs so that uh, businesses no, no longer need to take care of initial geospatial that sourcing challenges and uh, hosting uh, hosting itself uh, themselves uh, yeah and it's a new generation generation approach to to the supply of geographic geographic data services that has not uh, been present in the Baltic uh, market uh, from local spatial data vendor until now. Uh, yeah, please, next slide. Uh, and um, yeah, and please, next. And uh, our data plays an uh, input role in the concept of a location intelligent by uh, using our data as an input information in a specific location intelligent technology techno, technological processes and softwares the business uh, has obtained valuable output results these results give them uh, new insights into the future operational and uh, of course strat strategic direction of the of of, of the business these outputs and uh, logical decisions are classified as a, of course, this uh, location intelligent. Uh, currently, we we geodata hubs uh, geodata hub special input data have been grouped in uh, three main groups: so location, maps, and direction. Uh, under location group, it has a, please next slide, and uh, under the location group has services. Uh, access which related to address and uh, point of interest data information. This geodata services need for many institutions in their everyday work, such as uh, emer emergency ID institution, waste management, uh, delivery services, etc. At this moment, mostly of uh, our clients using it for, of course, for simply address validation, but uh, 
but but uh, many of them uh, also use it for their lo uh, location intelligence software as the input geodata for complicated analysts which uh, in the in the end of the day give give, give them the important important answers on how to provide their service better and more cost uh, effectively please next slide uh, under the maps group uh, has service access which related to base map information it, it provides for our customer solutions a precise and detailed base maps uh, for example uh, forestry is one of the most important industry here in latvia and and uh, our maps are very accurately published and classify local forest roads this and uh, really narrow roads which is uh, which uh, these forestry companies use in their internal and external technology, technological analytic processes. And uh, that component add also this uh, location intelligence uh, information for them and add this, uh, this monetary value. Uh, please, next slide. Um, under the location group has service uh, uh, access which uh, related to vehicle routing information uh, with the kind of restriction imposed by COVID-19, any kind of uh, issues related to the logistic or and delivery of goods have become even more important. Um, there, there, therefore, it's important for service providers which work in, in this uh, business directions. So uh, to receive the most actual routing services for usage in their specific softwares that give them valuable operational uh, information and also this location intelligence. Uh, Geodata provides routing and optimization IPAs, which uh, helps our clients optimal deliver a product and service to their customers. Uh, yeah, please, next slide. Uh, all the service are provided to integrators uh, in a modern self-service portal for uh, the Geodata uh, Hub. Uh, uh, customers doesn't have to take a lot of bureaucratic steps to try uh, out or start subscri uh, subscribing to these uh, IPAs. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks uh, you for your attention and feel free to try Geodate Hub and uh, welcome on board. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valdis. Uh, I think without any further ado, I will hand it over to Javier, who's here with us from uh, Carto. So please. Yes. Um, well, <clears throat> first, hello, everybody. And well, thank you for inviting us to participate in in this webinar. My name is Javier Pérez Trofero and I'm the head of data at, uh, at Carto. For those of you who may not be uh, that familiar with uh, what we do, we have built a, a location intelligence uh, platform, so a technology platform that allows data scientists, data analysts and developers to solve geospatial problems uh, with ac access to location data uh, and then analytical and visualization capabilities. Today, uh, I will focus uh, obviously on, on the data observatory, that is this component uh, of our stack, that is a, a marketplace uh, granting access to external data to, to uh, our users. Uh, next. So um, in Carto, depending of uh, depending of the type of user, you have different interfaces, different uh, methods, and different components that uh, you can use to leverage our technology. So if you are a data scientist, uh, you would probably use Carto Frames, that is our Python uh, package that allows you to exploit all the uh, technological capabilities of Carto from the Python Jupyter Notebook uh, environment. If you are an an uh, a data analyst, uh, you probably want to use uh, Carto Builder. That is our own approach to the BI world, so allowing analysts to run um, more basic geospatial analytics and build interactive dashboards with a drag and drop uh, web interface. And then for developers, we, we provide access, so direct access to all of uh, our APIs and libraries for them to build custom applications. So, powering 
all that, we have the, the data observatory that has uh, methods connected to these different interfaces that allows uh, our users to augment and enrich their own data with uh, a collection of more than 8,000 public and premium uh, location uh, data sets from multiple um, from multiple categories, uh, some of uh, the ones that you see here, like road traffic, financial, human mobility, demographics, and, and so on. I will comment more a bit later. So next. And wh why are we doing this? So, I mean, we've seen, I mean, working extensively with uh, ourselves and also with our customers over the, the last years, that um, in any data project, there's a lot of time that is spent in things like looking what uh, data is available uh, out there and, uh, that is relevant for, for the analysis or for the project that you that you are trying to solve. Then uh, when you've detected this, then you will have to go and contact the different providers that offer this type of data and then negotiate the terms for acquiring the, the different licenses to use, um, to use the data under the different uh, conditions. Once you, you have um, access to the data, if you're uh, purchasing data from multiple providers, you most, most likely are going to receive the data in many multiple different uh, data sharing, data exchange uh, systems ranging from uh, proprietary file sharing systems to uh, Amazon Web Services uh, S3 buckets or um, technologies uh, similar to, to that. And then when you do this, then you start, uh, you still have to ETL the data into the uh, anal uh, analysis platform that you that you want to use. And this process is, is very expensive in both time and the resources that you have to allocate to go through all these um, all these steps. And, and we feel that this is pushing people away to actually building uh, data centric organization so this is what we're trying to we're trying to solve so we want our users to focus all of their time or most of their time doing analysis with the data rather than all those uh, data admin tasks so for this reason i mean is is why we we build the data observatory so the data observatory offers uh, simple access integrated with the components of our technology to a vast array or a vast array of public and premium uh, data from sources that we have vetted, so sources that we have um, evaluated, we have assessed, uh, and then that we have uh, onboarded in our platform. For the premium side uh, of these different data sets, we have closed each seller and um, collaboration partnerships with the different data providers offering this data, meaning that we have we can accelerate and speed up a lot the licensing uh, process. And then, um, as I said, so the data has been uh, standardized. So all these uh, different types of data, we have put them in um, standard standard formats and integrated in into the platform. So as soon as uh, so the public data is self service, but then the premium data, as soon as the the subscription has been acquired, the data is already ETL, so it's ready to query and always up to date for our users. And then we also offer them other integrations like uh, with, well, overall Carto uh, plugs very well with uh, cloud data warehouse test technologies. So same happens with for the data. So next. So in summary, what uh, our data observatory um, does is to simplify a lot the first the discovery phase. So if you check our data catalog, you will see that we um, provide metadata uh, consistent metadata across all these 8,000 data sets from the multiple providers and multiple categories um, and access to sample data and, and a preview and, and so on on the same consistent way. Uh, and then same happens with the, with the access to the data sets as soon as you want to start working with them. We have also uh, put in place the, the agreements uh, that are standard and this allows us to offer uh, a very quick service when it uh, when it comes to licensing and acquiring premium licenses for for these data sets and this also means that Carto is positioned to become one stop shop for the technology but also for uh, for the special data that you want for for your project and then on top of that then is when we start to put you know more complex methods like for enrichment in which uh, you may have your own data already aggregated with some boundaries can be like 
a postal codes, and then you want to append to that table features, variables from third party data, we have methods uh, to actually um, do that uh, very easily. Uh, next. And this is where, when uh, these are some, I mean, most of the data categories uh, that take part of our data observatory. So all of them obviously have a location component that can be based on a point, a line, or, or a polygon. And within a polygon, we work with a standard grid systems, like, uh, like the quad key grids, but also with um, admin, uh, admin boundaries. So we have data from from the financial categories, or more like credit card aggregations, or index based uh, on aggregated uh, data from credit card transactions, from our partnership with uh, Mastercard. Then we have human mobility, so also like food traffic, food flow aggregations in different sort of boundaries provided by uh, telcos like Vodafone, but also companies uh, more on on the mobile app world like Onacast and Safegraph. We also work with TomTom and, and here for the road traffic data and well, so on. And, and as you see here, so also demographics, um, more behavioral um, type of data, real estate, point of interest, weather, the boundaries, and also this year we had to create the COVID-19 category to, to also help uh, organizations, both uh, public and private, to, to run analysis on the impacts of, of the pandemic. So um, finally, so in, in a nutshell, I think, so it's not one one. So we, we have, so right now in the, the observatory, uh, we have data across 11 uh, different categories coming from 35 different sources. But as I said, we have vetted uh, all of them. And this amounts to, to more than, than 8,000 special data sets. Uh, and this number keeps growing uh, week over week. Um, so I actually invite you now if, if you want to go to, to carto.com slash data and that will give you access to, to what we call the spatial data catalog uh, in which you, you can navigate uh, all this offer and, and you know, analyze all the details uh, of all these different data sets that, that we can provide. So, and thank you. Thank you very much, Javier, for that uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, so now that we have uh, gained kind of insights from uh, from the data observatory, Living Atlas, also uh, what was presented by GeoData Hub, uh, we think that it's uh, we can we can probably conclude on this note. So we have uh, three key messages really that we want to convey uh, from this session before we open uh, the Q and A. Um, so. There's some background noise. Um, don't know if everyone is on mute. Um, the first message being that um, geodata marketplaces is really a concept of building on developments over the past uh, decades. So virtual marketplaces, digital platforms, and more have uh, really paved the way for new and improved ways of exchanging, providing, and using data. Um, and the, the case studies that we saw today were, were really examples of that, right? And the second uh, point is that geo data marketplaces are powered by ecosystems thinking. See that new and innovative models uh, creating uh, interactive and living marketplaces are really made possible by sustainable ecosystems of actors working together. Last uh, key message is also then that geodata marketplaces really encapsulate uh, this ecosystem's thinking and it serves as an enabler for location intelligence. That means that by exchanging data through geodata marketplaces, we can really um, derive new and deeper uh, geospatial insight. Um, so on that note, I think I will give the floor back to, to Simon, who will uh, moderate uh, the Q&A session for the last uh, few minutes of, of our allocated time. So, so please, Simon. Yes, thank you, Leia. Thank you, George. And thank you for all the guest speakers, uh, Jill, Javier, and uh, uh, Valdis. Uh, for giving us uh, really interesting uh, presentations. 
I think in the meantime, we had already some questions popping uh, up in the chat box uh, from many of you. So uh, I think Martin asked already uh, two questions. Please, Martin, would you, would you uh, like to pose the question by yourself? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Thanks a lot for really interesting uh, information and uh, just just I was curious to see uh, in case of maybe I would start uh, with the last question uh, for all platform presenters uh, which uh, type of uh, API uh, is from your experience the most uh, uh, expected or respected uh, uh, sorry not the uh, required uh, from your customers or users uh, could you pick up the, the most uh, really uh, requested one? And maybe the second question would go for the platform uh, uh, called the Geodata Hub. Uh, aside of the, how, how easy it is to ensure that the data you are somehow integrating in your platform are kept up to date? and uh, which uh, of the pricing plans you have available on the website is the most uh, used or requested, uh, at least uh, by this moment. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Martin. So please, uh, Javier and Valdis. Hey, yeah. Maybe, maybe I, yes. I can start because yeah, for us, for Geodate Hub is the three question if I, correctly understand so um yeah actually we followed this uh, uh with this data data providers and regularly contact to to them about this uh, data changes and that's the way how, how we are yeah checking it is any 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 new new this uh, raw data accessible and uh, yeah because uh, of course we are working only with this uh, uh, trustable sources is uh, more and uh, especially from this uh, yeah governmental institution which uh, produce this 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 data in, in this raw format and um, yeah at the moment we are uh, focusing uh, more uh, on this uh, data which necessary actually uh, for business and that <laughs> that's not surprise that the most uh, most uh, this uh, required uh, IPAs are simply address address validation and uh, this 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 base maps this uh, really detailed accurate uh, uh, updated uh, base maps that's uh, that's the reality here in Baltic because yeah this this the business actually now here not uh, flying in a really high 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 uh, clouds they they still need this this basic fundamental but trustable data i mean this yeah location and and and, and this this fundamental of the geospatial data and um, yeah actually um, if i'm a bit uh, yeah touch this uh, this this uh, about uh, pricing uh, it's of course a bit confid confidential issue but uh, okay if i'm honest of course the most popular is uh, is this development uh, plan which is uh, which is the we 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 made this plan uh, and the make uh, main idea is that we want that everyone can uh, uh, yeah to, to 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 test and try how it work is it uh, suitable and uh, is it yeah that what they expected from this IPA and that this in in, in and this development plan is for free. But uh, okay, of course, the, 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 uh, in the, if we are talking about this real sub subscribing plans, that yeah, this, this micro is the most popular still because yeah, this 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 um, this uh, point uh, point amount is quite high, and here uh, in Baltic, it's uh, it's uh, it's a good uh, good good enough for many of this uh, uh, yeah our clients. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Valdis. I think there is another question from Geraldine. If I'm correct, Geraldine, please. You were asking about the metadata standards. To which would you like to address this question? Uh, I'd like to, to address it to Javier, uh, if it's possible. 
Okay, thank you. So please, Javier. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. So in terms of the metadata, metadata standards, um, we, I think I would call it that at the end of this work has been a proprietary uh, system. I mean, we started based on schema.org, but then, um, so and that I think covers most of uh, most of it, and it's the the same. For example, if you if you have a look at Google's uh, da data set search, so if you want to list um, the contents of your catalog over there, they, they follow that that same one. So that's for the basic sort of um, metadata for all the data sets, and then obviously we had to put things of our own that uh, um, allow us the this integration of of the catalog and and the repository of the data sets and all the pro, uh, processes that handle the subscriptions to our users uh, with the same, you know, uh, consulting the same metadata database. Um, so I would say we, we started from schema.org and then ended up with something that combines uh, that with some uh, proprietary attributes that we required. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Uh, so I suppose we can move to the next question, uh, which was posed by, by Ula, asking about the features functionalities. Please, Ula, would you like to post a question and to whom? Yes, I would. Thank you so much for the floor and thank you for very interesting presentations. I think I would like to um, to reach out to Deloitte uh, as, a, as, as starters. Of course, I do appreciate other inputs as well. I was wondering um, if you're going to start from, from more or less scratch having your SDI as a basis. Are there like three or five features or functionalities that you should consider adding uh, to this SDI in order to go towards uh, creating a marketplace? George, should I, should I start? Or? Had a point there, Leah. Sure, go ahead. All right. Uh, so I think that uh, how we see that from our point of view when we're talking about uh, geodata marketplace, uh, the important uh, one, of course, key important aspect of, of the SDI is the the partnership that evolves it. Right. So this links uh, quite nicely with the with the the concept of um, of um, of uh, data ecosystems. Um, in addition to that, of course, there is the aspect of interoperability. Um, there's uh, there's uh, many different, uh, what we're seeing in, in research we're doing for other projects for Elise as well, is that uh, there's new and innovative ways to solve uh, the need for, for standardization, for interoperability. Um, you have certain ecosystems that uh, have uh, employ their own standards uh, in the chat here as well. There was a conversation about standards. So I think that we would probably emphasize the need for, for interoperability and for sustainable uh, data ecosystems. Um, now, I don't know, uh, George, if you have anything to add. Uh, yeah, one, one component that I might add to that is just the basic feature of, uh, of searchability and findability in order to provide the the services that you're that you're looking for. That's the, the other feature I might mention. And I'm I'm sorry, I didn't catch your your last phrases. Uh, the, <laughs> I think the connection is a bit a bit unstable. Could could you please uh, repeat? Thank you. Sorry, that was just the, the feature uh, within the marketplace of of searchability and, and findability of the particular type of uh, of data that you are looking for. So see, that is a, a key aspect of a geodata marketplace as well. Thank you so much, both of you. Oh, <clears throat> I think we are uh, slowly running uh, out of time. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience, maybe at this moment? So if this is not the case, uh, uh, I would like to uh, thank everybody. And uh, please, Leah, if you could uh, move to the next slide. So uh, I would like to use the opportunity to invite you for the next webinars. So uh, next week, uh, we are continuing with the geospatially enabled modeling, simulation, and prediction at the same time as usual place. 
And uh, in the beginning of February, uh, we would like to announce uh, the study presentation, Evolution of the Access to Spatial Data for environment, Environmental uh, uh, Purposes. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for all presenting, for all attending. And uh, you are, of course, uh, kindly uh, welcome to follow us on the different, through different channels, which you can see on the last uh, slide. And uh, see you at the uh, next webinar. Have a nice day. Bye bye.